Hello, my fellow Theatset people. Uh, it is week one of ShakeTube 2019, where three wonderful booktubers, who I will link down below, are hosting a read-along of Shakespeare's plays. Uh, each week, they are picking a different Shakespearean play uh, amongst themselves, making for three on Saturday, three uh, next Saturday, three next Saturday, and then they're all combining for the two two gentlemen of Verona for the final final Saturday of September. Uh, this video is for Coriolanus, which was picked by Steve Donahue, which, to be honest, I did not think I was reading all three plays this week, and I thought Coriolanus would be the one that, oh, maybe I'd find some kind of, some YouTube video pick thing of it, and I would watch it, and I would kind of add it on to the end of the thing, but I started reading it, and it was hard to read. It was, it was difficult. It was it, and then it started sucking me in, and I ended up reading the entire play, and I ended up uh, going to the local library and getting uh, a uh, really top-flight adaptation of it, a theatrical adaptation by it uh, by Ralph Fiennes. But I'll get to that get to that later. So Coriolanus, Coriolanus is it's uh, one of Shakespeare's um, Roman plays, um, and this takes place uh, with um, like Julius Caesar. Uh, that that kind of thing is this is at the very fall of the Republic and into the into the rise of Octavian Octavian Augustus Caesar uh, we get the Empire but this is this is back in the Republic back in the times of the Republic much much earlier uh, this is when this is really it's just it's the city and uh, and uh, Coriolanus is one of the one of the great soldiers of the city, and he is hated by the people because he has scorn for the people. Uh, at the beginning of the play, he's like basically railing against them, uh, but he he distinguishes himself in battle, and he gets put up for the greatest honor, which is to be elected elected one of the uh, consuls of of Rome. Rome worked on a system where I believe it's like yearly. Um, two two people would be put forward, uh, maybe alternating years as consuls to to be the executive power of the of this of this uh, state. Now, like Rome wasn't a democracy. Rome actually had a very large. I don't know how large it was at this point, but a slave population. There were so there were the slaves who got no say whatsoever. There was the next kind of the kind of like the the plebs. The, the, this, 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 the citizens who some of whom could be freed slaves, uh, just poor, poor people. Uh, and then you get into the kind of the aristocracy, uh, the, the lords, the nobles, the patricians who, who probably still made like the majority of the, uh, the, the position of the, um, the decisions. Uh, and then you have like the, and what would be get, you get the consuls who were elected from, uh, more the military side of things. It's actually only later that patricians get to become consuls as well. Rome never had a, like a written constitution. It was very flexible. And, and some people, I think Machiavelli among them talk about, uh, that's one of the reasons why the Ro Roman Republic and, uh, further on kind of was able to survive for so long and thrive because it was a flexible, uh, very chaotic system, but it was flexible in, in that. So Coriolanus gets put up as a consul and initially he gets approved, but, um, due to um, a couple of uh, leaders, a couple of leaders of the kind of the, lo the lower classes, uh, they kind of point out, uh, he didn't want to give you guys, he didn't want to feed you guys. He, he, he was like, he was really harsh on you. He seems to have a lot of scorn and mocks you. He won't show you his scars from the battle, which is the, the proper thing for, proper thing for someone who's coming up for a consulship should do is like show you, show how you kind of gave yourself for your country. Uh, and, um, he, Coriolanus refuses to do that. Uh, and so they, re they end up rejecting him and he gets so pissed off. He says some, really he says inflammatory things that basically his enemies are able to take advantage of that and uh are able to banish him and he is so angered by this banishment uh that he actually goes over to the enemy he had just recently kind of um he had defeated off of uh and offers up his services to him to take down rome because i want you know out of out of pure spite and indeed Coriolanus is such this amazing figure is such um like you know this isn't this is a world that doesn't seem to have gods but Coriolanus is the mover he is the guy who if he's on your side your army will win and indeed he brings he brings the um this this enemy army to uh, to Rome and is going to take it down and in the end 
you know, they send all these people to ask him. They they send his they send an old kind of like army army colleague to send to him. They send a, a basically kind of a mentor figure, um, me, uh, Menaeus to Menaeus to um, to kind of try and talk him down. And he's like away away. Uh, you know, he doesn't he doesn't know any of these people. He sends his mother and his wife and his child to plead with him. Uh, and in in the end, he does change his mind. I'll get to the thing of like why he changes why he cuts he steps down he steps down at which point Aphidias who's been like worried because he's basically taken over his army say basically sets his his people on him and they kill him and that is the that is the end of the play um so yeah you get you get you get um you know at the beginning of this play you get Coriolanus it's like behold you know when he sees when he sees the tribunes of the people behold these are the tribunes of the people the tongues of the common mouth i do despise them for they do prank them in authority against all noble sufferance he that depends upon your favors swims with fins of lead this is what he says later and hews down oaks with rushes hang ye trust ye with every minute you change your mind and call him noble that was your hate so it's it's like he he really points out like you know this this roiling mob he has the complete disdain for it and it's like you have no brains you have no constancy um he is all about valor he um I've been, I listened to a couple of lectures by a fellow uh, professor, a University of Virginia lecturer. I think I listened to him last year too, uh, Paul Cantor. Uh, he did uh, Shakespeare and politics and he did, he did uh, a couple of lectures on, on, um, he did three lectures on uh, Corleonis, 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 uh, Linus. And, and it was, and um, he was very much talking about the idea of a thumos or a valor, I think is how uh, it's kind of in Shakespeare of this thing of it's, it's basically, it's, it's, it's the idea of kind of like athletes have it, soldiers have it. It's like why you go into battle, why you don't flee because of, it's like, br it's a bravery. It's, it's a kind of, it's this kind of merit, which, you know, if Coriolanus doesn't see it in you, like this common people, it's like you're you're worth nothing to him. It's like he says, like, like you people, you go you go to battle. Like when you when we draft you into battle, you just go in for game for your own needs. There's, there's uh talked about there's Th Thumas and there's uh, eros and an eros and this isn't just erotic thing. It's like all your needs, all your wants, all your appetites. And it's like um when when Coriolanus wins his big battle, he's like, oh here's all this money, here's all this stuff, and he says like, no, I don't want that. I just want I want the glory. I want, there's very much, he is a very proud, too proud of a figure, too proud of a figure in this. Now, he is, it's, it's an, he's an interesting creature because possibly the greatest relationship in this play isn't between him and Ophidius, which is interesting and highly, uh, uh, kind of erotic, uh, when they, when they meet, uh, this Ophidius is like, when, when, when Coriolanus comes to Ophidius, he says, um, but I, that I see thee here, thou noble thing, more dances my rapt heart than when I first, my wedded mistress, saw bestride my threshold. And he talks about, you know, hugging him, taking him in his arms. It's like this almost erotic, um, brace. But, um, Cantor in his lectures was talking about like, when you have a society where valor is such the greatest thing, well, then it's the, it's the, um, it's the blood, it's the bond of of brothers of war, even opposing brothers of war is stronger than any erotic or eros love uh, in this play. And indeed um, his wife is very much kind of pushed to the side. Now I was talking about what I consider like probably the most interesting, the, the, of uh, the most interesting of the interesting relationships in this play. And that has got to be between Coriolanus and his mother, uh, Volumnia, who is, who is someone who he's, when he sees her coming, she says, this is the honored mold wherein this trunk was framed. Uh, Volumnia has made Coriolanus. Um, when she says, when she talks about raising him, she says, I, considering how honor would become such a person, this little, little child of hers, when Coriolanus was a child, uh, that it, it was no better than a picture like to hang by the wall, if renown made it not stir, was pleased to let him seek danger where he was like to find fame. To cruel war I sent him, from whence he returned, his brows bound with oak, and also 
comes back as this killing machine, as this rage filled, um, as this rage filled guy. Um, and, and indeed, her, her relationship, she's basically kind of living vicariously through Coriolanus. Uh, and the, the, the name Coriolanus isn't his birth name. This is his battle name. He, he goes when he, when he is in his, in this battle in the opening, in the start of this play, he, he, he basically massacres single-handedly uh the corleos and so as, as thus is given by his by as part of his honors is given the name coriolanus so it's like if 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 you sent in like an american general to vietnam and you, you came home and you called him vietnam it's like oh my god it's like that kind of martial um valor um kind of just like and and embracing it there's no there's no oh you know, was it right to be there or not? No, this is like might makes right. Uh, I am, <laughs> I am wearing a T-shirt which I got when I was in Italy just recently. Uh, haha, name drop uh, doesn't happen often. Where we've got the Greeks, we got the Romans, we got the Arabic, and we've had the Etruscans. The Etruscans were people that had the misfortune of being pretty abutted up against the Romans when they were rising. Their culture was destroyed. Their language was destroyed. We still have remnants of it now, but the, they were the first kind of the first wave of getting absorbed into this great Roman uh, war machine. This great, I mean terrifying and 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 vibrant uh but uh you know uh and and creative but also horribly destructive um it was just like and i think this is a part of the thing of why shakespeare was so interested in 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 rome is just like this is this is the the prime example of of uh the great civilization before and like how did they or order themselves especially maybe as a it's interesting that he's going to this thing of as a republic of like you know Yes, it's a great it's a great machine. It's it's also horribly chaotic. Uh, in some of the sa same ways you could say of his own time, of you have multiple kind of queens and kings and queens coming in, changing religions uh, as they do uh, from uh, you know Protest Roman Catholic to Protestant or Roman Catholic to Protestant again. Uh, it's like unsettled times, but also vibrant, exciting times. Um, um so yes so yes volumnia is just like an is is one of these characters as i was as i was reading the thing i was like oh i know i'm gonna i'm i was thinking to myself i'm gonna gonna try and rent coriolanus i wonder who who finds ralph finds uh voldemort for all those folks out there is going to get to play uh get to play uh volumnia and it is it is uh, Vanessa Redgrave who does an amazing, amazing job. If you get a chance to watch it, she does an amazing uh, thing of playing this very kind of flinty, ambitious woman, but also doing it in not like a... It's interesting because I've heard it described um, in um, um, this book here as Volumnia as a kind of a bullying character, but it's not like she's bullying as much as... This is like she also has Thumas. Um, this... Um, the, the idea, it's like, you know, you send your, your, this idea of you send your sons to battle for, for, for glory, for valor, for, for the greatest, the greatest, um, value that this, that this, the Roman society has. And indeed, Paul Cantor talks about, uh, in his lectures about how Shakespeare was someone who, you know, had very limited sources. I think he was using uh, Plutarch as his as his uh, his source for the uh, life of Coriolanus of of how he um, was doing kind of like his own intellectual archaeology here of getting to like you know how did this society feel about um, you know how how it educated its young. There's a there's a strong implication here that Coriolanus was ill educated, that he wasn't he was somebody who was, yes, amazing on the battlefield, but you got him into politics and he just, you know, explodes and explodes. And indeed at the end, I mean it's interesting, in the Roman system, he is kind of held to some sort of account uh, of of a ordered system. They like they judge him as a traitor. Yes, it might be this high, kind of highly charged and manipulated system, but there's sort of a process, and so he gets banished. Whereas when he runs afoul of Othodius at the end, it's mob rule, and they just stab him to death, and that's it. It's like um, which 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 of those systems is is probably more stable? You can see why the Roman system is maybe the one that is the dominant is a dominant one, and indeed toys with. Uh, 
these other these other little city state these other little cities and is going to eat them all up and and become and become bigger um i'm going to switch I, I think i'll switch right now because i'm 15 minutes in to to ralph finds uh i'm probably ralph or ralph finds uh coriolanus uh mr voldemort there uh or uh the English patient, as I prefer to think of him as. Um, his is his first directorial debut, and he is also playing the title role of Coriolanus, and he really captures that kind of angriness. Now, it's interesting, he uses Coriolanus, he sets it, as you see, they're not holding so swords in this picture. I don't know if I can get it without the glare. They're holding machine guns, and this is, this. Uh, he actually filmed it in uh, Serbia, uh, and had them kind of walking amongst kind of ruined buildings of you you think about kind of this area in like the 1980s 90s and it's just like it's totally war torn uh and it gives it in and while a lot of the lead actors are british and american a lot of the um kind of the 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 kind of the 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 the, the lower the lower the lower cast um you know, kind of the citizens and all that stuff are played by, by, uh, I believe Serbian or just kind of European actors in that area. So you, you, it gives you kind of a, a kind of a class, it ends up gives, gives you a kind of an interesting kind of class divide as also probably, I'm sure as the, uh, economics of, of selling a film, you need to have name people, which is why uh, you have Ophidias here played by, uh, that hunk of man meet, uh, Gerard Butler, who, who, acquits himself actually quite well. I've heard people say that this is his punch drunk love, i.e. this is a someone who's not known for his great acting actually getting to do, you know, some acting and does and being this is greatest role. I actually don't think it's his greatest role. I think Mr. Butler is actually greatest at his most blah, this is Sparta kind of hamminess and I, I really enjoy him. I think that he gets his power there. I think he acquits himself well here. As I said, when you put put him up against someone like Vanessa Redgrave, uh, doing uh, just just this fascinating job, or Brian Cox. Brian Cox is also a real standout here. Um, I, they, you know, they they um, they sort of eat up. They 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 eat up this in a way that's a couple of major levels above uh, Gerard Butler. But George B Butler can freaking rock those abs, man, and and just you know be as awesomely stupid in. Uh, uh, in be awesome in awesomely stupid movies. I'm not saying he's a stupid man, but um, it's a it's a tribute to his thing. But so, um, he 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 films this in a modern setting. Uh, a lot of the kind of the dialogue uh, is done very much through like kind of the the, the um the uh, a lot of the kind of the, a messenger comes in. It's like it's a guy on the TV talking. Um, um, and it's actually it's good because Coriolanus is a play, um, unlike. A lot of other Shakespeare plays, and I think what kind of made me ha gave me trouble with it at the beginning was this is a public play. This is a play of not poetical language. This is a play of rhetoric, of speeches, of of um, that kind of a thing. It's very kind of bald and stripped down uh, in a way that people that probably like something like you know maybe like Twelfth Night. Um, which has much more of a kind of a poetical thing or God, Midsummer Night's Dream. It's like the guy who wrote Midsummer Night's Dream wrote Coriolanus, which is like amazing to me because this is a play of just savage, brutal, thumping kind of language, uh, very powerful language. But um, it doesn't have as uh, I think I was re when I was listening to Paul Cantor's lectures, I will put them down below. He talks about how there's sort of a lack of relative lack of soliloquies in this play. This is not an interior play. This is a play of public speeches. And indeed, when when uh, Coriolanus's mother comes to plead with him at the end, Coriolanus refuses to have like a private conversation with him, with her. She says, okay, Ophidias and your, and your people, you should all hear this as well. Everything is done out in the open. And uh, at the beginning, Coriolanus is kind of tried in the court of public opinion and con con and condemned. There's very much a, a thing of this play of you it's got the, that kind of contemporary thing of there's no there's no private life anymore uh in in this play there's no private life uh in our society in a way anymore everything everything is public if you're a politician everything's fair game to the media and indeed in Corlanius he gets ripped apart because he he's not a reflective man he's not able to put on 
uh, thing and say, "Oh, here are my wounds." It's like you know, he he finds he scorns that, he, and he can't con- he can't conceal his contempt. He can't put on the the kind of the mask that a lot of politicians you have to feel do put on the mask uh, for their contempt, for their like distaste for this roiling mob. Which you have to admit, <laughs> a lot of times we sure get roiling mobbish. Um, Vines also does an amazing job of, I think, just casting. Uh, you know, you think about. Uh, in this mo- in this movie, something like um, Gerard Butler, who is known, I know him, that my favorite role is 300, which has got a lot of homoerotic or homosocial, you know, these are all these naked, oiled up men kind of striding around being brothers of arms, and there's not very many women. And in, in, in indeed, their relationship of Ophidias to Coriolanus kind of taps totally into that part of, uh, of Gerard Butler's persona, um, as does, I mean, he casts himself very well of, of, of finds is very good at kind of coiled of that kind of coiled rage and scorn, um, which has come through in um, Voldemort, uh, comes, comes to mind. Voldemort and Coriolanus, um, could, could get along in some worlds, uh, I, I would think, or have, have like minds. It's, it's, it's funny how something so maybe you would think is such later, but finds is really smart at kind of casting people um, that he casts. I haven't even mentioned Jessica Chastain, someone who apparently um, after uh, finds showed a rough cut of this to Catherine Bigelow, she got cast in zero dark, a uh, zero dark 30. Oh God, whatever it's called. The, um, the assassination, uh, not assassination, the, the finding of, of uh, Osama bin Laden. Uh, and, um, God, I hope I got my things right because now I'm just talking out of my ass. But uh, she got cast in a Catherine Bigelow film after having, um, after seeing, after sh- the director saw a rough cut of her in this. And it's it's striking that they, because Fines could have picked a, car- a a actress who was like sort of lesser known, and because it's a sort of a, in some ways, it's a nothing part. He really highlights how she is isolated and outside of Coriolanus's relationship with his mother. Like his mother's relationship is is unnatural is too it's it's close in a way that it shuts it it shuts it out of having him having another relationship with an a adult relationship with another woman um in a way which so he 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 does a really good job because chastain is somebody who can very quietly i think i i think of just clips of her in tree of life it's like ah, that's being able to do that film acting that kind of calls attention to her it's like you should be looking at her you should be wondering why Coriolanus does not have anything with her while at the end you know she she makes her plead and that doesn't really move Coriolanus it's interesting at the end of Coriolanus um why does he switch why does he why does he switch back why does he say nope I'm gonna make I'm gonna make uh instead of making war on Rome I'm gonna make pe- I'm gonna help the enemy and Rome have make peace make peace together. And, um, you know, because he's had his friends asked him, his mentor asked him, his wife and his son asked him, and his mother even appeal, appeals to him. And his mother doesn't, mother is the one, because I think there's like, she appeals as a mother, as like, you're going to trample my womb uh, as you trample Rome. But uh, in the end, she also says, well, you're going to be, you're, go- you're going to be, cur- you're going to be cursed. This is going to, this is going to be, uh, see if I can find it or if it, it, it's, it's, where I, sorry, I'm going to find this quote because I think this is the thing that if thou conquer Rome, the benefit which thou shalt thereby reap is such a name whose repetition will be dogged with curses, whose chronicle thus writ, the man was noble. But with his last attempt, he wiped it out, destroyed his country, and his name remains to the ensuing age abhorred. It's like, finally in the end with Coriolanus, it isn't like the appeal of his mother or his wife that finally make, cracks him. It may affect him. And in the, in the movie, uh, Fines definitely plays it as, oh, this affects me and hurts me. But it's like, in the end, it's that Coriolanus is valor is going to come into question that his that his glory his pride will be destroyed and in the end he doesn't destroy rome because that will destroy his valor and stuff like that so he makes peace and then he goes back to ophidius and his men and probably full well knowing he's going to die because he doesn't have any fear about that he doesn't he doesn't fear death he fears his 
his valor and pride being thing. And once that is, and once that is secure, he can die. And, in, and, and you, 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 you get that, you get that at the end that, that, and I mean, he gets called traitor and when he gets called traitor, it pisses him off to no end. It pisses him off at the beginning of the play and it pisses him off at the end because that is the worst thing. It's like, he is about valor. He is about kind of love of, about, um, it's love of country, which is not erotic love. It's, it's valor. It's, 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 um, thumos. Uh, so yes, thank you, Steve. I wasn't going to read this play and it sucked me in. <laughs> so, um, here's, here's seeing what the next choices were. And I have gone on and on, but yes, I would highly recommend if you get a chance, uh, to, uh, uh, pick up Coriolanus. He does in- indulge in the, well, I like the close up, but he does close up with a bit of kind of, uh, a kind of handheld documentary style. And sometimes that's a little, a little too much, a little overwhelming. I mean, maybe perhaps it is supposed to be, but it is a very visceral, very visceral, uh, inexpensively made, but visceral film. So, uh, you know, it's like, uh, top, top, top flight talent there. Uh, and I, and it's really great to see, um, a great actor, uh, make his, de- make his decisions, uh, both acting decisions and directing decisions, uh, and get to see that. So yes, I would totally recommend, uh, Coriolanus, uh, directed by Ralph Fiennes, 20, 2011, that hunk of man meet, uh, Gerard Butler, but most especially, uh, Vanessa Redgrave. Yes. Check it out. More videos later.